welcome back. It is October 13th. We're going to talk about even more word problems. Just got to talk about the rules. Here's the copyright notice again, in case you didn't see it the first time. There you go. In the freeware GMAT prep. Okay. Um, when we talk about word problems in general, we um, we have a few other sessions of the same thing. But basically, what you got to understand when you do word problems is what causes the trouble that people have with word problems in the first place. Like in other words, why do people even have this issue? So just to recap a discussion that we had in the previous study hall sessions about this, like why, or it, instead of thinking about why do people find word problems hard in tests and stuff, you should actually think about the opposite, which is why do people find them so much easier in the real world? Because they totally do. Like when people are dealing with things like spreadsheets and you know, real world balance sheets and stuff like that, and most people have much less trouble manipulating those things than they do abstract stuff like test problems. So basically the question that's prompted by that is why are word problems so much easier in the real world? And we, we had a discussion in a couple of the earlier sessions on word problems, so you can you can check those out in the archive if you need to. But basically, when people process math problems, whatever type of math problems they happen to be in the real world, there are two tasks that people successfully separate, and they and they totally separate these things. Two separate tasks, which are the first one is physically organizing the problem. And I mean, this is exemplified by when people make things like Excel sheets. Like, if you think about making a spreadsheet, when you first make a spreadsheet, it is empty. It doesn't have numbers in it yet. And, and, and you make the whole thing before you start putting things like numbers and formulas in it. Right, let me smiley face if that makes sense. Like you, don't, you don't start messing around with things like numbers and relationships until you have a setup. So, I mean, you're not literally making spreadsheets on this test, but this is the step that is like making an empty Excel sheet. So if you think about it, this could be a diagram, it could be a chart, it could be a table, it could be any number of things. A chart, table, diagram, the other organizational device. And you only pay attention to what you need to to do that. We'll get back to that in a sec. Then, once you have a chart that exists, once this organizational device exists, you put information into it. There are three kinds of information. There's numbers, there's relationships, and there's the goal of the problem. Two separate steps. Like again, think about doing these things. They're separate. And then only once you've done all of this, we're going to put this into practice here in a second. So once you've done both of these things, 
only then hit the strategy and try to solve. Let's let's put this to work. Let's do a problem. There you go. Remember, you, guys, you have freedom of how you can organize these. Like in most of these problems, you are not going to be organizing the problem with any kind of memorized template. There's a couple of notable exceptions to this, one of which is the uh, overlapping sets thing. Like those, you're always going to organize in pretty much exactly the same way. But those are notable for that reason. Like in most of these problems, you have considerable freedom as to how you actually want to organize the problem. So, there's the gig. Here's where you are going to pick the multiple choice answers once you have one. Please pick them here. Please do not pick an answer in the chat box. Thank you all. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that one. Go for it. Okay, please do not write down work in the chat box, guys. The point of this is to do the work by yourself. This test is a solo effort, not a team effort. Um, about the about like sixty percent of you still don't have answered yet. So um, if you have to guess, you should guess. Remember the way this exam works. You can't move on. You can't leave questions blank. You can't revisit questions. You can't come back and change your answers later. Can't do any of those things at all. So you have to get used to just picking an answer and committing to it. Right. Give you like 20 more seconds, everybody needs to pick something. Okay, let's talk about it. Um, Looks like the uh, answers are mostly A, B, and D. That's Alpha, Bravo, and Delta. Alligator, boy, and dog. There's not a lot of people picking C or E. So, let's talk about it. Okay. Um, let's talk about physically organizing the problem. I mean, for the most part, physical organization is not some stroke of genius. So make sure that you are not thinking about it as though it is. Like, please do not make sure that, you, please do not think that you have to organize these things in ways that are, like, incredibly genius. Because um, you don't. For the most part, it's like making a spreadsheet. Except less complicated than a spreadsheet. Because spreadsheets have many, many, many rows and columns. Like, how did you organize this problem? I need somebody to summarize for me in the chat box. There's a way. Yeah, it's pretty much just going to be like a bunch of numbers down a column or something, right? Yeah, pretty much. So either, yeah, seven rows or seven columns, and that's kind of it. Now, here's the even more important part. So, now what you don't want to do yet is anything with fours and R's and stuff like that. Nope, don't do that yet. Nope. 
Here, let's talk about colors. Remember, think about why this stuff is easy in the real world. The reason why this stuff is easier in the real world is because people only do the orange stuff when they're doing the orange stuff. And then after they've done the orange stuff, they do the blue stuff. Does that make sense? What what color is it? like they 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 do the, they make an empty chart and then they put stuff in it. They, they don't make a chart and try to fill it at the same time they're making it. Just think about making charts in the real world. It's like you make empty charts and then you fill them. The point is that you make the whole chart first. That's the point. Like, let's, let's look at what out of this text we actually have to read to do the orange step. Like, what do we need? Let me shrink this a little bit. There. Okay. Because, I mean, the, the point is to ignore a lot of stuff each time. Like, what do we actually need to organize the problem? Not, not a lot of it. I mean, okay, you have first planted. You don't pay attention to the four feet right now because that's later. That, that's a number that goes in that chart. Same thing, constant amount. We don't care right now because that's not, that's blue stuff. That's a math relationship. Four is a number. Constant heights of relationship. Just ignore those things. Six years. And of course, you, you have heights. And then at the end of these years, one fifth taller than is another math relationship, so ignore it for now. And then that's an orange thing. And then how many feet? Increasing. That's it. Like all we read the first time is the orange box. That's it. You are ignoring everything else. Give me a smile if makes that makes sense. And again, the, the next time you make a chart for anything in, in the real world, just pay attention to this. Pay attention to what you actually use to make the chart and what you put off until later. So, yeah, we can just do that with seven rows, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, let's move out of stuff. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Start. End of year one. End of year two. End of year three. End of year four. End of year five. I would actually strongly suggest writing all these things out. It only takes like five extra seconds of your life, and it's worth it to not get Because if you just write year six, then you might get confused as whether it's the beginning or end of year six. If you write this out, there's no confusion at all. Okay, that's an organizational device. Look at that. Not a big accomplishment, but you do it first. Now we do the blue step. So, now, yeah, you go back to the problem, and now you're paying attention to everything you did not pay attention to the first time. So, it was four foot tall. So, that's four in the start row. What does constant about each year mean?
It means you do what operation? From row to row. It's actually not the same rate of growth. It's not actually. Depends on how you define rate. Could be. That's ambiguous though. Because when you say rate of growth, that like when people talk about rates of things like interest, that is actually not the same as this. Like if you have a bank account that has a growth rate of like five percent, that's actually multiplying by one point oh five every time. That that's not adding a number every time. The context will not be ambiguous, but you, you guys should know the word rate could mean adding or multiplying. It depends, right? Interest rates are multiplying. Whereas rates of things like per day or per year or per something like that are usually additive. So just make sure that you look at the context and make sure it's clear. So, but you're going to be adding the same amount. Each year, okay. Because it's not a constant ratio; it's a constant amount. That's the key. That's what determines that. Yeah, constant amount is an amount is a quantity that you are adding to something. You log in. Okay. Um, sometimes people hesitate with this, but what is the only thing that this could really mean? And this one fish taller than that's that's sort of weird the way they wrote that, but that's that's clearly not one fifth of a foot taller, because the smallest number in the choices is three tenths of a foot every single year. So there's no way this difference could be one fifth of a foot. And they're not negligent. Like they, if this was one fifth of a foot, they would never have forgotten to write foot. So who can tell me what this is? Yeah, it's 20%. One, remember, percentages and fractions are the same thing. So if this doesn't make sense to you as one-fifth taller, just write it as an equivalent form that uses the percentage. Yep. So let's say that this, let's call these things this and that. And we're told that that is 20% taller than this. So if you don't know how to do this, it's in our fraction decimal percents reference, but that's 1.20 times. So that is 1.2. Okay. How do we solve the problem? Couple ways. How can we do it without algebra? Yeah, you can just you can just you work backwards from the choices. Let's let's try that. Um, let's back solve. Sure. So you plug in a choice, and you just keep adding it. And then what you're going to check is you're going to check that, that thing about 1.2 because that's the only other fact in the problem. But notice, before, yeah, like notice how not overwhelming this is when we've broken it up into the orange steps and the blue steps. It's like very tractable. It's very doable. These things are only overwhelming if you try to do the orange and the blue steps. Okay, let's try to do this. Uh, if you add a half a foot every year, this would be 4.5. This would be 5. 
Seven is not twenty percent more than six. That's incorrect. Okay. What? Uh, no, it's not. Remember, in fact, if you are adding a constant amount, then by definition, it's not a constant percentage change, and vice versa. Because if you think about it, um, this is in response to Sandeep's question. If you're adding the same amount, like imagine you have a kid who grows like three inches a year. Like when that kid is still a small kid, that, that three inches is going to be a pretty big percentage of that kid's height, right? But when that kid's an adult who's or a teenager who's like five or six feet tall, it's going to be a much smaller percentage. Versus if you have a percentage growth, then that's going to be a more and more height per year, the taller the kid gets. So, no, those, it has to be one or the other of those. It actually cannot be both unless it's zero percent. So, let me get a smiley face if that makes sense. Cool. All right, so these are not right. Uh, the next ugliest fraction to me would probably be the two fifths because at least those are terminating decimals. So I'd go for that next. I'd go for the two fifths. Um, that's 0.4. So that's 4.8. There's 5.2. That's 5.6. That's 6. And that's 6.4. So, okay, is one point, remember all you're checking is whether 1.2 times 5.6 is equal to 6.4. You don't need to work this out all the way. Like, if you set this multiplication up, just, like, think about it, right? If you're, like, okay, 1.2 times 5.6. I mean, the first step is going to give you a 2 here, and then you get some digits up there. And then it's like blah, 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 blah. And then you're going to have two decimal places. In other words, it's going to look like that. that that's not 6.4. So I, I don't care what this number is, because it's not 6.4. Smiley face if that makes sense. This is another big mistake people make when they do things like back solving and smart numbers is they actually work out all the calculations all the way instead of remembering that the goal is just to see whether they work or don't work. Like as soon as you realize that this is not going to be 6.4, there's zero reason to keep doing it. So yeah, if we that's not right. If we do two thirds. Sorry, two fifths. Two thirds. That's going to have to have to keep those as fractions. So that's four. That's four and two thirds. That's going to be five and one third. That's going to be six. This is going to be six and two thirds. This is going to be seven and one third. And this is going to be eight. So the numbers we're looking at which are six and two thirds and eight. So is but one point two is a fraction now. So uh, six fifths. So it is six fifths times six and two thirds. Six and two thirds is twenty thirds. Is that equal to eight? Well, So 
six over three is two. That's 40 over 5. That's 8. Look at that. We win. So it's D, dog. No algebra necessary. You can do algebra. Of course you can. Um, any questions about this non-algebraic method? Smiley face does make sense. My face thingy. Cool. All right. Let's let's get rid of the algebra super quick. There's a blank version of that chart again. Okay. If you do it algebraically, you might as well let X stand for the growth rate or the growth amount each year because that's the thing you want anyway. So this would just be 4 plus X. This would be 4 plus X plus another X. And so uh, you just keep adding X. Like I noticed the same organizational device is great, right? Like you use it, it's the same thing no matter which strategy you pick. So if you use that as one half times this, four plus six x. Sorry, it's not one half, one half. Yeah, I'd rather use fractions for that. With algebra, it's usually easier to get a fraction. Notice the skill set of being able to go back and forth between fractions and decimals is super important here, too. Like, you got to be able to kick it back and forth between 1.2 and 6 over 5. There, there can't really be hesitation there. So let's multiply both sides by 5. That gives us 20 plus 30x is 24 plus 24x. Give us traction. And there you go. Any questions? Now, when you review the problem, the single most important thing you can do when you review problems is not let yourself do whatever you did the first time. So if you did algebra the first time, make yourself back solve when you review. If you did back solving the first time, make yourself do algebra when you review. Whatever, you, just whatever it is, the point is to develop a diversity of solutions. Okay, let's do it. about I just realized I was off the mic. Um, don't forget to separate these tasks as best you can. Don't forget where the multiple choice answers are located. Have fun. There's still only five people with answers. It's not a lot of people.
I mean, remember, this should not be a kind of thing where when Ron is like, guys, got to answer the question, like, 350, you start pouring in the answers. I mean, remember how time management works on this test. Time management is basically just you admit when you're stuck and you quit. That's basically all it is. Okay, let's talk about it. You get an interesting answer distribution. You got almost even numbers of people picking B, C, and E. And then no one's picking A or D. Let's talk about it. To organize it first. I mean, there's some, some sort of organizing, right? Something. Something that can help you make this less overwhelming. Because, yeah, about two thirds of people got this wrong. So, something is clearly an issue. Let's talk about organizing it. What's happening in the problem? Like, what is the problem asking you to do? Yeah, it's asking you to simplify a formula. So it's like a procedural thing, right? How would you map that out? How would you map out the simplification of a formula on, like, every day, you know, all planet Earth? How would you do that? You could make a chart, yeah, with the different parts, and then you could, like, make a... I mean, I'm sure that some of you guys in, in the jobs that you do would probably call this a workflow or something like that, or a flow chart, something. It's basically a workflow. I mean, you take stuff and you do things to get it simplified stuff. So it's like a workflow. So the orange thing could just be setting up a workflow, a chart with different terms. Yeah, right? So. And again, you don't worry about the specifics because that's the blue part. So you're going to add something, don't care yet, to the average of something I don't care yet and something else. I mean, honestly, that's kind of all you care about right now is that. It, it is and it isn't because reading comp is not this detail oriented in a specific way. Like you, you wouldn't if it was reading comp, you wouldn't be paying any attention on this level of detail. But on a certain, I get what you're saying, which is on some level of analogy, that's true. Like you're kind of to whatever extent there's like a main idea of the problem, you're kind of looking for it. That's kind of an interesting way to. I mean, that's actually a very insightful way to think about this. Yeah, it's kind of what the deal is. You you could think of it as orange thing. It's like a main idea of problems. It's actually, a very cool way to think about it. Uh, the main idea of this problem, yeah, is you're going to take something and add it to the average of something and something else. You guys know how to take average things. You add them, and you divide by two. That's not that hard. It's only hard if you try to do everything at the same time. That's when it gets hard. Now you go back and figure out the rest of the detail.
So the I is defined at the end of the problem. So this is just two percent of I. We haven't done we haven't done anything with that stuff yet. Like literally, Sandeep we haven't even touched it yet. Like all like we have only. I mean, let me white out the words just to make this point more emphatic. Like we have only looked at these words. Like the the numbers one hundred and percent, those kinds of things don't even exist yet. That's all we got right now. That. Because that's, I mean, that, at a large scale, that's all you're doing is you're adding blah, 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 blah to the average of blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And then you figure out what the blah, blah, blahs are. That's the point, though. You just, if there's different layers of stuff, don't pay attention to more than one layer at a time. Okay. So 2% of one's annual income is 2% of I. You should probably do it as fractions, because these are fractions. These, these are not decimal. So, probably do these as fractions. So that's 2I over 100. Which is the same as I over 100. Okay, and then you're taking the arithmetic mean of 100. Is that clear to you guys now, Claire? Same deep, are we good? So level of looking at one layer of meaning at a time. It's, it's, you know, if you had to do this on a tax form, I'm sure you guys would be all over it. You're like, okay, just to figure out this deduction. You gotta take this thing from line 36 on form 1040A and add it to the average of this form from schedule B and this line from form schedule as B. You guys would be fine with that. It wouldn't be overwhelming. Try to just bring in the same intuition here. So, um, how's my sound, everyone else? Is my sound messed up? Okay, good. 100 units of currency is just literally 100 units of currency, so that's 100. And then 1% of the annual income is just I over 100. So, all right. Okay, you got to know how to deal with these fractional expressions. I mean, you can just multiply the top and bottom of this by two. Or you can actually multiply by 100 to get rid of that. Sorry, not two. You get 100 to get rid of the small denominator. That gets rid of the picture in picture fraction, so to speak. So we'll leave this one alone for a second. I over 50 plus. This is going to be over 200 now. That's going to be 10,000 plus I. And a common denominator. So that's going to be four I over two hundred 
plus all this stuff. So that winds up being 5i plus 10,000. Which answer choice is that? And how much of this do you have to pay attention to? It's going to simplify to one of the choices, though. I mean, which is the only part we have to look at. Remember to always be doing this with your head. Up. Like, some people are looking at 10,000 over 200 first, but that'd be a mistake. Because these are five different I terms. So if you figure out the I term is, sorry, 3I over 100 is the same in B and E. But if you get anything, it's not 3I over 100. You're done. So you could pick numbers, although if you did pick numbers, in this case, you would not circumvent any of the work. Because if you, when you review the problem, you should still make sure that you can do it. But you would still have to run those numbers through all of this. Um, the main advantage of doing that would be that you would no longer have to deal with fractions inside other fractions, which might annoy you. But it doesn't save you as much work as it normally does. But that's you should, when you review the problem, you should absolutely try it. So th this is this is I over forty. So I have a 40 plus stuff, so you're done. So that's choice C. Just make sure that you like, do that with your head. Uh, yeah, your head. Uh, but there's, this is a lot more different things here, so you would start here. Gives you better chances to actually eliminate that. Any questions about that? Try the picking numbers at home on this problem. Uh, make sure you can do it. I mean, it, it would be literally the same process. You would, be, you would be picking a number and running it through the same sequence of steps. The only advantage being that you would no longer have to do things like common denominators and fractions. Like if I was 100, well, let's do it. Let's say you pick I as 100. It'll take, it won't, won't take any longer to do it, and we'll talk about it. So if you think I is 100, then this is going to just be 2. Plus. That average works out to be 100 plus 1 over 2. And that's not amazingly beautiful, but that's let's see where it goes. So that's two plus one on one over two. That's two plus fifty point five. So that's fifty two point five. And then remember, you picked I as 100. And then you have these choices. So you can see where the trade off is. I mean, the trade off is you don't have to do fractions anymore. So it's clearly not D or E, because those are more than 100. And then this is 50. This is A is 50 plus 1 half. That's, that's only 50. Uh, B is 50 plus 3, 100 over 100, that's 50 plus 3. And this is 50 plus 100 over 40, which is, that's 50 plus 2.5. There you go. So you can also pick numbers. Any questions? Smiley guy, if that makes sense. And remember, when you review, the goal is to 
jump in this menu there. Let's do another one. Let's see. What about this one? Okay, you know where the multiple choice answers are. Please do not type text in the chat box. Go for it. Um, currently, two of you have a choice that is logically impossible selected. So don't do that. Don't pick impossible choices. Looks like we got a smart Alec in the chat box. Got to pick something, guys. Um, does anybody know which is the impossible answer choice? Actually, that one's impossible, too. Yeah, that one's also impossible. Here. Um, you know where the answer choices are by now. Let's say that I didn't even tell you what the question was. And I was like, blah, 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 question mark. Sorry, question mark comes later. Blah, 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 period. Which of the following must be true? Roman numeral one um, run is between zero and 80 years old. Roman numeral two Run is between 20 and 80 years old. Roman numeral 3. Run is between 10 and 40 years old. Uh, can anybody tell me something about these three statements? Like, if you know, like, which one of these can't be true without also making another one of them true? Yeah, if either, like, if two is true, then so is one. And if three is true, then also so is one. So, Two without one is impossible, and three without one is also impossible. I mean, it's not a thing if that makes sense. This is the same thing. These are more annoying looking because they're algebraic quantities, but you, you should definitely not have picked B or C to this problem. The other, the other choices are at least logically consistent with themselves. But, yeah. Like, if you found out that Ron had to be in his 30s, for example, then all three of them would be true. Um, 
that sort of thing. Okay. So, but you definitely shouldn't have picked B or D, or sorry, B or C, because those are not things. Those are not possible. Okay, now let's actually do the problem. Okay. Orange stuff. Let's organize. Orange is figure out what's happening and organize the problem. Okay. So you have two fixtures. What what happens when they give you something alone would take a certain amount of time? What is that really giving you? This is something you should recognize instantly. It's very important to recognize. That's a rate statement, exactly. Like if I say, notice that nothing actually takes C hours in this problem. That's important to understand. Like if I say that I would take five hours to paint a whole house, I'm not doing anything for five hours. What that is, that's a rate. It's all it is. That, I, all I'm telling you is how fast I work. So, like, same thing. I could type 300 pages in seven hours. That doesn't mean I'm going to actually go type 300 pages. I'm just telling you how fast I could, I could use it. So, this is a rate. If that's not instant recognition, you should definitely practice that recognition. Just flip through a bunch of problems and see if you can recognize what that's a rate. It's one over C buckets per hour. Okay. The hot water, same sort of thing, would fill it. That's another rate. And then you like at the same time. So you're going to be adding some rates. Okay. There we go. I mean, for rate problems, you might not even need a whole formal chart because if you know that this is a rate of 1 over C buckets per hour, it's a rate of 1 over H buckets per hour. And you, you might not even need the, the physical whole chart and stuff. But, so the cold tap alone, the rate is 1 over C buckets per hour. And then the hot tap line is one of the H buckets per hour. So what do we do with this thing? What would you guys do with that? Yeah, well, first you, so you want to figure out where you got that from, right? Like, the point is to add the rates. That's really the only, like, relationship, relationship we need here, right? Just add these. So, the combined rate. So picking values is dangerous, or at least you have to be very thorough about it, because when it says must be true or could be true, that means you can't pick one set of values, because you would actually have to, you would actually have to systematically and exhaustively test these things. 
when you review the problem, you should make sure that you do that, but that is not necessarily going to be efficient, but you should try it. So the combined rate is the, is the sum of these. So it's 1 over C plus 1 over H seconds per hour. So common denominator. That's going to be H plus C over CH. Okay. I mean, no, yeah, picking values is just as good. Sure. So then you have rate times time is for one bucket. Which is what we want. We want, we want that. So it's that thing. Rate times buckets per hour times hours equals buckets. Remember, the point is not does this save time. The point is to accumulate as many ways to solve these things as you can. You don't want to think about does it save time. You just want to do stuff and not, not do stuff. The worst thing that you can do is think about whether stuff will save time in the middle of doing it. So that, that's that's going to cost you dearly. Because what that will do is make you just reluctant to do anything. Careful with that. H plus C over CH times T to think of solving for. Okay, so if you solve that, it's CH over H plus C. Okay, now that's 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 the T. How do you tell? How do you tell whether it falls in these ranges or not? And you could start throwing values at it. And again, when you review the problem, you should make sure. But you don't need to plug in anything. No. Nah. I and mean, what if these were just normal fractions that weren't fractions with letters in them? Like, how would you tell? How would you tell if like three sevenths was between two fifths and one half? Remember that these are still fractions. I mean, they have ugly letters in them instead of numbers, but they're not any less of fractions than they, than they used to be. I mean, how do you tell if one fraction is between other fractions? Mm, you yeah, cross multiply that. I mean, not just three of them. Like here, if you. Remember that cross multiplying is fundamentally not a thing anyway. Like, what what are you doing when you cross multiply? You should you should know what you're doing. And like, basically, is this? We want to know if this expression fits in this range or not. How do you tell whether this is true? Yeah, I thought you just make a common denominator, guys. It's exactly like having regular fractions. If this was like three sevenths and this was one half, and I wanted to know if five elevenths or something was in there, I would just you can't cross multiply because you have three fractions, but you could just give them all the common denominator of everybody. So yeah, sure. So. 
Let's give everybody a comment on there. So these two guys also have age plus C. And then these have to be a small plus by two. All right. So this becomes every is over the same denominator now. So it is H C plus C squared plus then two C H H C which is H C plus H squared. Um, the work for that was on the board for a while. It was, it was, if you want to check the recording when they post it, then is I already killed? Oh, the, the work, the work is still there. Actually, I think it's underneath this white app. Yeah, it is. So I can uncover that later. If you want to see that after we're done, I can just uncover it. Um, notice this is HC plus HC. So this is absolutely true because H is bigger than C. So C times C is going to be less than the HCs are all the same. These left hand terms are the same in all three. And then if you compare these guys, those. Those, that's, that's true. C times C is less than H times C, which is less than H times H, because H is bigger than C. So, so 3 is yes. And it looks like we're done because it's E. It's the only choice left that has I, I, I in it. Cool. You know what else you can also do? See, okay, this is kind of a lot of work. And what they do, if you you should also, when you review, you should also test numbers, but that's a lot of work too. Um, you should also test numbers, but that's not going to be a panacea here. This will also be a lot of work because must be true means you have to test enough values to convince yourself that that I, I, I is always going to be true. Um, we put, well, if three is true, then we're done because it's the only choice left that has three in it. Two is wrong because the choices. I mean, you would do two the same way. You would just you would just line it up like this and give it a common denominator H plus C, and then you would. Um, less than H would definitely have to be true because, in fact, this is less than half of H. But greater than C would not would not have to be true. So th this inequality would not work. Um, but there's also like when there's this much work in the problem. You know what else consistently happens? A lot of the time, you can just be like, yo, common sense. That's a thing. You do that a lot of the time. And when there's this much, when there's this much stuff happening in the problem, always think about common sense first. 
I mean, I've seen problems where there is like backbreaking amount of work, but if you actually the, the the answer choices had like square roots of three and pi in them and stuff, and it was like how much area is this grass field? And if you actually estimated the numbers, then four of the choices were negative, and only one of them was actually a positive number. So like if you bothered to do that, you'd be like, I don't even have to do the work. That's kind of cool. Remember, these choices are logically impossible. It doesn't matter what the level is. You should never think about that. That's not a thing. Okay. Um, remember, these are logically impossible. Okay. Let's just think about this with common sense, guys. If you had two of these taps, C hour. How long would that? How long would that take to fill the whole thing? If you had two of those, instead of one, if you have one, then it takes C hours. If you had two of those, how long would it take? It would take half the time. Yeah. If you had two of these taps, it would take half the time to fill the thing. Smiley face if that makes sense. Basically, if you have two of anything working at it, so you're twice the rate, and you're going to finish in half the time. Oh, but wait a minute. That's the fast tap. Because C is less than H. This is just faster time. So, these two pipes will take longer than that. Uh. Yeah. What about the H hours? We had two of those. Same same deal, right? If you had two of these things, it's gonna take H over two. Same kind of reasoning. But this is the slow tap, so you're actually going to be faster than that. The two taps we have together will be faster than H over two hours. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. We just solved the problem. Thing. And when you review the problems, you should, I mean, if you ever find that a problem involves just an annoying amount of busy work, and that even when you do non-algebraic methods, that it still involves an annoying amount of busy work, then you should, when you review, you should really think, like, is there a way I can just smack this problem with common sense. Because there probably will be. But that's the thing these guys do. So be aware of that. I mean, I, you know, because in this problem, both the algebra method and the testing numbers method are, are lots of steps. So they, they will build in either one of the methods like back solving or smart numbers or what have you will be fewer steps or like it'll be super efficient. Or you'll have something like this where you can just like think about it and be like, oh, yeah. Boom. But think about this when you review. They do this. The thing. 
So and then if number three is true, then you're finished because the choice is right. So you don't need to think about it. Um, you you can also you know if you think about these things like it's not going to take you longer with two tabs. Uh, you can also realize that statement two is false. I mean that's also common sense because C is how long the cold tap takes alone. So if you turn on the cold tap and anything else, then it's definitely going to take you less than C, right? So elim eliminating two is even quicker because this is how long the cold tap takes by itself. You have the cold tab and another tab. So T is definitely less than C. So that's that's out. Um, there, there's no there's no should. I mean you should try whatever comes to mind first. It's gonna be a combination of your personal skill set and also random inspiration. I mean like if you if you wake up one day and you feel like picking numbers, you should pick numbers. You wake up one day and you feel like doing algebra, you should do algebra. You just do stuff. I mean, again, this is not a backbreaking amount of algebra. I mean, it's not. This is still very doable. I mean, this is not, oh my God, it's going to take me all night. So that's not the point. The point is that you can still collect lots of other ways to do this thing. But you should always just first thing that pops into your head, you just do it. You should never think about, is there a faster way? You should never think about, is there a better way when you are under timing conditions? Don't, don't do it. I mean, if you, if you can think of a situation with common sense, of course you should always do that first because common sense doesn't take time. I mean, if you have this insight, you'll have it quickly. So if there's anything you want to try at the beginning, it would be bad. Which in the real world we just do that, right? Like when you when you face a real world problem, you you make a common sense estimate first. Like if you're doing a tax deduction, you probably have some idea how big the deduction should wind up being. Yeah, like if you take a deduction that was twelve thousand dollars last year, and you have about the same income, and, and suddenly it's like forty two thousand dollars, then you probably made a mistake. It's like that. But otherwise, you just do stuff. Do stuff and don't not do stuff. Okay. Um, I got to run. But we've got another one of these in two weeks. So, thank you. Good evening, good morning, good night. Um, <clears throat> it might be verbal. It might not. No one knows, man. It. it I don't know what the themes are going to be until literally about 45 minutes before we start. So it's not next week. It's the week after next. So, okay, going to kill the recording.